Ray, thanks so much for being on the show. It's an honor to have you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Appreciate what you're doing. Let's get started with some off the cuff questions. If you were the governor for one day, what would you do? Hmm, good question. Um, I guess I could say sarcastically, I'd, I'd resign because I don't think anybody would want me as governor. But, um, you know, I don't know that there's one thing I would do. There are so many issues that the governor faces. Is I, I would have to really understand what the priorities are in that circumstances and, and then build a, a solution around what we think is the top priority. Okay. If you had to change one rule in the state government process, what would it be? Well, I um, the focus of my career for the most part has been healthcare. Um, so I recently battled an issue regarding certificate of need, um, which regulates healthcare facilities in Georgia. And um, I, I think it's an antiquated law that should be removed altogether. Um, there should be safeguards on quality and, and safety, um, but I think the market should be able to work on that. So I would, I would remove the certificate of need laws. Okay, cool. And if you had to educate the public the role of a lobbyist, how would you tell them? You know, I've used um, several different analogies over the years um, as being a lobbyist. Um, one is we are the company firemen, um, if you will, in the political sense that we, there's sometimes when we need to prevent fires, um, sometimes we need to um, suppress fires. And then there are other times when we need to start fires uh, because the forest doesn't grow if there's too much growth. So you have to burn the floor. So sometimes for growth, our job is to, is to start a fire, politically speaking. Um, the other analogy I've used is we're an insurance product it is uh, because when you need us, you need us. And if you need us and you don't have us, it's, it's almost too late. Um, you, you can't afford the premiums uh, um, and the damage is already done. And so, I really look at it that way. Um, obviously, the you know Webster's dictionary definition would be to um, uh, convey a message from a certain entity regarding a policy position and try to influence that position one way or another. What skills do you think are essential for someone to be a good lobbyist? Um, I'll have to ask somebody who is a good lobbyist, but, uh, <laughs> <Too> but, <humble. laughs> uh, for my opinion, um, I think situational analysis, uh, is, is very important. Um, I think being honest, being humble, um, being likable, um, having credibility in your particular, um, knowledge base in your particular space that you're working in. Um, and, and then just have the ability to talk to folks get to know them. Um, don't be afraid to answer questions. Don't be afraid to say no um, if you don't know the answer to something. Um, but then be honest with the policymakers, be honest with your client about what you can and can't do. Um, and, uh, but I think situational analysis is the key. If, if you don't understand the situation you're in, you can't possibly develop solutions. You, and number one, you can't understand the problem. And number two, you can't develop solutions to those problems. And that's part of the role we have is, and I tell our, my folks, we, we shouldn't make operational decisions without understanding what the political ramifications might be. Uh, and then it works, you know, uh, vice versa. We shouldn't make political decisions unless we understand what the operational impacts might be. How would you define happiness? As a lobbyist? Sure. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways uh, as a, as a husband, as a father, uh, you know, to, to describe happiness. But um, I think, you know, having um, the support uh, of your clients and who you represent, knowing that you believe in what you're representing. Um, I've been fortunate over the years to have a pretty good um, belief system and been advocating for. 
Um, and if I feel like at the end of the day, I've done my job in promoting and, and representing the interests of my client, then from a lobbying perspective, that's happiness. It, you know, it always amuses me that those lobbyists that are trying to pitch a client, they say, well, I've never lost a bill. I've never lost an issue. Well, then they've never really fought one, uh, to be honest with you. So winning and losing is a, is a relative game in this. Um, you know, I, I lost for three sessions on a recent issue um, on CON, and then in the fourth session, we were able to get it done. So I, I think that, um, you know, that, that's where happiness would come from in, in the job. I know your esteemed career, you might have a lot of, had a lot of successes. But I think, you know, you can also learn a lot from your failures. So can you tell us um, one failure which you had in your career and what did you learn from it? Um, well, it, just the issue I just named, um, we were, and I represent the cancer hospital here in Noonan and there were restrictions on the number of Georgians that could be seen in the facility. And uh, which was a artifact of previous policy. Um, and uh, I was hired to change that. And it, I was hired in 16. Um, and then it took me to 19 um, to get it done. And so I, I think what, I, what I've learned is, is don't be afraid to take on the challenge. It, you know, don't, don't just take the easy clients, take the, the difficult clients. Um, and be willing to recalibrate your strategies, um, recognizing what didn't work and what did work, and then being able to um, uh, recalibrate it and develop new strategies, bring on new, uh, new solutions. Um, so, you know, failing at that for three years, um, although progress was being made, it might not have been seen, uh, but progress was being made. Um, and, and don't give up um, because, uh, you know, if you keep fighting, fight the right way, you got a good chance eventually of winning. Very cool. Okay. I, I'm into Avengers and the superhero stuff. So if you had one superpower, what would that be? Wow. One superpower. Um, understanding. The, the ability to understand. Um, because again, if you're, if you're not really aware of what you understand and don't understand what people are saying and a lot of people, they may not say what they mean. So if I had a, an innate ability just to understand what folks really meant and what they were really saying, um, then it would lead me to a solution that much quicker. Oh, well answered. One last question I had for you in the quick fire. If you could have dinner with any three people, dead or alive, who would they be and why? Oh, man. Um, you made me tear up on that one. Um, my parents, yeah. who are both deceased, um, and my grandfather, who I'm named after, who I never met. And uh, I try to honor his name, but it'd be nice to meet him, for sure. No, oh, I'm sorry to bring that up. Um, no, it's good. It's a good, it's a good thing. Okay. With that, let's go into a bit into your childhood. Uh, where did you grow up and how was your childhood like? All right. I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, my dad was a physician. Uh, my mother was a homemaker. Uh, I have a twin sister, um, two older sisters and an older brother. Um, I had a great childhood. Um, I was Fairly um, rambunctious, um, like to get in a lot of trouble, uh, un unfortunately. Um, I did, um, you know, went to local high schools, um, and then I went to a, a military high school, uh, Marion mm -hmm. Military Institute in Marion, Alabama. Um, my granddaddy went there, uh, my daddy went there, so I was, you know, kind of pleased to follow the family tradition. Um, I think it prepared me a lot for the challenges that you face as an adult and as a man and trying to um, take care of yourself, take care of your families. Um, so, you know, my childhood was um, fairly normal in that regard. Um, then went on to college. Um, I graduated from Huntington College in Montgomery. Um, so I had, you know, a good childhood. Having a twin sister was great uh, because 
the girls were always at our house. Um, so that was always fun. <laughs> and, well, you know, that was where I found myself a lot um, playing all the different sports growing up. Too. Oh, cool. And like growing up, did you have any special interest in politics? You know, not really. And it, it's ironic because growing up in Montgomery, Alabama is a state capital. And, you know, I learned later in life that a lot of my parents' friends were, there were some lobbyists in there and some business executives and association management executives. Um, I, I didn't really, you know, grow up with an interest in politics. When I was in college, I did a little bit of work for the governor of Alabama, but it, it was just, you know, um, intern type stuff. Um, so it wasn't anything that's like, whoa, I got, this is what I got to do. So I didn't really have that influence. It wasn't until after college that I found that. Oh, cool. And, and what were you aspiring to be? Like usually, you know, when you're a, ch a child, you had always aspired to be an astronaut or something big, <laughs> right? You know, what were you thinking of trying to be? You know, it, it's interesting. I didn't really have, um, anything that much set. I look back on it and I probably would want to be a coach. Um, my granddaddy was a coach. Um, and I, I, you know, obviously enjoy sports, but I enjoy the teamwork, I enjoy the competition. Um, so if I think if I didn't do this, uh, if I wouldn't do a lobby and I would I'd probably be a coach somewhere. Oh, very cool. And um, so you said you went to the military school. I mean, was that because you your parents or someone told you to be in there or how did how did that happen you know um that's one of the things i want to ask my dad at this dinner um that i'd have with him uh frankly but um i think it was you know i think my dad wanted somebody to carry on the family tradition and i think he also recognized it was something i needed uh, i needed the structure i needed the organization uh, um, and so, it, it, you know, the decision was made to, for me to go. Uh, I, my junior and senior year of high school um, were there. And I look back on it, and I, obviously I, I didn't understand it back then, but I understand it uh, now and why uh, they did what they did. Oh, okay, cool. And so after you went to, you went to the Marion Military Institute, mm -hmm. um, after that, what triggered you to get into the political science realm? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, so my freshman year, um, my academic counselor was also the dean of the business department. And like a lot of folks in the, in the late 70s, going into college, you majored in business administration, right? Because there weren't that many specific majors you could do at this point in time. And um, after the first semester, I, I kind of struggled. Um, and he called me in there and he, he said, you know, I think you need to switch over to liberal arts uh, because that's where your, your brain is oriented in, in language and verbal, verbal technology and terminology, excuse me. And, you know, I really didn't understand what the marginal propensity to consume really meant from a business or an economic perspective. I get it now, but I didn't get it then. Um, so. I think moving over to liberal arts kind of opened my eyes to other um, futures and other careers that, and that I could pursue um, with a history um, background. There's an interesting side to that when you ask me the question about jobs and how I got into the politics. So. Oh, okay. So, uh, so if you had, um, let's say, if you could turn back the clocks, right, and you had something to change the course of what you have been through would you change the course or would you like to stick to what you're doing what you what you've been to uh you know I, I if i had any regret i said i didn't i didn't force myself to go to law school um you know and and that good you know as a lobbyist if you're a lawyer it gives you a little bit of a different depth in the, in the way you approach it and i've been doing it for 40 years so I can pretend to be a lobbyist, I'm a lawyer um, on it, but I think if I had that, I would do that. I would. I don't regret the decisions I've made. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happily married. I have two great children, grandchild, good career. Um, you know, the path has been good. I've been blessed. Cool. So after you graduated from college, I see that you became the vice president at Omni Resource Group. Can you tell mm -hmm. us what was that all about? 
so that was the like fourth job out of college uh, for me. Um, it, it, but it, it was a contract lobbying firm um, that actually my father-in-law um, ran. He, I, I married well for Georgia politics. Uh, my father-in-law was involved in, in Georgia politics. I didn't know that when I met my wife in DC, but, um, uh, but Omni, he started Omni as a consulting firm. And, and so I, um, I joined that after eight years in the business and developed a um, pretty substantial healthcare practice, um, building off of my experience representing physicians and, and, uh, and other healthcare providers. Um, so it, it, I had Big Pharma uh, was a client, ACS, Maximus, um, company called Logisticare, um, several physician groups uh, that I represented. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed about representing those clients, frankly, was the was the hunt and the kill, uh, was going out and marketing to potential clients and then meeting with clients, um, understand what their problems were, um, and then developing solutions to try to address their problems. Oh, so I'm sorry I didn't catch that then. So what was your first job right after college? Um, so I, um, I went to Washington, D.C., um, and my brother-in-law worked for a U.S. senator from Alabama, uh, named Jeremiah Denton. It's when Reagan was was president, um, and he uh, suggested that I come up there and talk to some folks. And I um, talked my way into a job on the House Committee on Agriculture. I knew nothing about agriculture, but I, I just I happened to do a chance interview and got hired, and um, and, and started my career there. Met my wife in in D.C. Uh, moved to Georgia and then was fortunate enough to be hired by um, U.S. Senator Sam Nunn. Um, and I ran a district office in his hometown of Perry, Georgia um, for three years, um, and then was contacted by a, a friend of mine with the, the Medical Association of Georgia to see if I was interested in coming and managing and lobbying for the Georgia Society of Ophthalmology, um, which is all the medical eye physicians. Um, and concurrent with that, I also represented the Georgia Academy of Family Physicians and the Georgia Osteopathic Medical Association. So I, I did that for eight years before I went to Omni. Oh, so, so after DC, um, what made you jump into the field of healthcare? You know, it's a good question. Um, it just happened. Uh, this friend of mine with the medical community um, called and asked if I was interested. And growing up, the son of a physician, um, and being, you know, immersed and involved in, in healthcare uh, um, all my life, and everything I'd ever really gotten in my life came from my dad's commitment to healthcare. So I thought it would be a good way to honor him, um, even though he, he wasn't an ophthalmologist, but he was a, a urologist, um, but a way to honor him to, um, uh, and to get into healthcare field. And it turned out to be a great niche. It has been a great niche for me. And um, I've represented most every aspect of healthcare um, that's out there. Um, so I have a pretty good knowledge base uh, of the healthcare systems and the changes. And fortunately it does keep changing. So there's always a need for representation um, and an advocacy in the political process. So for, if you're a young lobbyist, uh, you know, one of the things I would recommend to the number of young lobbyists that I've had the great opportunity to work with is find a niche. Uh, it's, it's good to know a lot uh, about a little, but sometimes your value is better if you're um, pretty well steeped in your subject matter, because that gives you credibility in what it is you're bringing to the table. Yeah, that's a good piece of advice. I was about to ask you, you know, if you if you had someone right now sitting in front of you and asking you, how do I get started in government relations? How would you answer that? Um, I think today the best way to get started is probably working on campaigns um, and then parlay that into a, if your candidate wins, um, uh, you know, get a position on staff. And then from that staff position, you start to develop relationships um, with other folks depending upon what subject matter you may be working for for that congressman or, or that state senator or state rep. Um, 
but I think that's a good way to, to get involved in it is to start in a campaign. Um, and, uh, and then there are a lot of folks, a lot of kids that come out of University of Georgia, for example, that intern at the Capitol um, and they get a, you know, a feel for it and decide if that's something they want to do or not. Okay. All right. So after that, I see that you moved on to Medical Association of Georgia. Can you tell us a little bit? I think you stayed there for about a year. Or so can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what did what kind of policies you worked on there and what was it all about? Yeah. So um, having worked for um, seven different medical specialty societies, um, I had uh, had left Omni and gone with a, a corporate interest called Logistic Care. Um, they asked me to build a governmental affairs uh, program for them. Um, but then the Medical Association of Georgia came calling and asked me if I would be interested in assuming the lead role for their governmental affairs. And um, it was kind of what I always thought would be my dream job uh, because of my, um, my heartfelt love for medicine and my appreciation for the practice of medicine given my dad's uh, history. Um, it was a difficult um, situation in, in any type of medical association lobbying. You're gonna deal with scope of practice issues um, with optometrists and psychologists and physical therapists and chiropractors. Um, because, and, and I think this is an unfortunate thing, frankly, is that each state sets the parameters for which those individuals um, that aren't quote medical doctors can practice. And it leads for a patchwork of policy across the country on where ophthalmologists or optometrists can do this and they can't do that, right? And so it's a very um, heated battle all the time, very well pitched. Um, I learned a lot uh, early in my career representing the ophthalmologists because the optometrists are very good at what they do in the political game. And to our earlier point about losing, um, I lost a lot um, on that. I compromised a lot but I learned a lot um, on how to fight those wars. Um, so scope of practice was a big point. At, at that point also in Georgia, we were just beginning to scratch the surface on tort reform. And uh, so I, I you know, non-lawyer, but still um, jumped into the tort reform fray um, and began to plow the ground um, for future passage of legislation um, that um, on tort reform. Unfortunately, the courts have, have overturned a lot of that, but um, it was an interesting time for me because my predecessor uh, at MAG had actually gone to the Trial Lawyers Association. So in a way, he knew what I was going to say before I said it. Um, so I had to develop some different arguments, different angles to present. Um, the legislature was still um, controlled by the Democrats at that point in time. So you had a less... Um, inviting environment for tort reform. Um, but I worked with um, some lobbyists from the Chamber of Commerce and some other interests, and we were able to get some things done. Um, but that was the predominant issue at the time. Um, you know, managed care was not that big of a player at the time. There weren't that many reimbursement issues out there. Um, and, and quality was not really being measured, so that wasn't as much of an issue. Um, so I'd say scope of practice and tort reform were the primary focus of my time at MIT. I see. And, and what is Logistic Care about? So Logistic Care is an interesting company that um, was founded by an entrepreneur who was a software developer um, and began to look at transportation issues in the healthcare setting. And so he created a model and pioneered a market actually that would allow state Medicaid programs, which are required by case law to provide non-emergency transportation to Medicaid recipients. And these are trips to dialysis, to um, pediatricians, to pharmacies, to mental health programs. Um, again, every state is required to do that. So he created a, a mousetrap or a model that's a managed care approach to transportation. Um, and it is, um, and that's why he hired me because we helped him win the first state contract that he had in Georgia. And then we wanted to grow the market across the country. So my job was to um, hire lobbyists in various states and work with those lobbyists to develop um, relationships 
and present this model to um, policymakers, to appropriators, to the governor's offices, to the Medicaid departments, um, and see if they would be willing to put out a, an RFP um, that we helped craft the RFP with the requirements, particularly the, um, the safety requirements, the experience. Um, and, and so we were able to win. I think when I left, we had 20 something contracts. When I started, we had two contracts. And uh, so I had the opportunity to hire lobbyists and work all over the country um, from Connecticut to Washington State to Minnesota to Texas. Uh, and then I did a pretty good amount of work in DC as well. Um, working with a DC lobbyist, we were able to get some language in the Deficit Reduction Act in 2006 that um, allowed states to move to this broker model without having to go through a pretty long waiver process. They could just amend their state Medicaid plan and move to that model. It, um, I think the net effect of it is it saved the state's money. It gave them budget predictability. It created a, a, a more comprehensive transportation network um, to ensure that these Medicaid recipients uh, were able to get to the health care that they needed. Hmm. So you you were worked there for almost a decade, is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, cool. And and after that, you moved on to Centene Corporation. Um, so what was that all about and how did you get that position? Um, so Centene um, had a, a Medicaid managed care product in Georgia, still do. Uh, it's called Peach State Health Plan. Um, and I, I was at a point in my life um, where, in my career, frankly, where I was pretty tired of traveling. Um, I had two young kids and two boys that I wanted to be home um, for, you know, to grow up with them for, as they grew up. I'm still growing up, so to, to, to grow up with them. Um, and uh, so I, I had a friend um, that was in the business with a competitor. She knew that um, Peach State was looking for a governmental affairs guy. And uh, so I, I went and applied and interviewed. And I think given my history in the state and my experience, uh, particularly in Medicaid, um, you know, they hired me. Uh, and my primary goal there was to um, win the rebid um, and work with legislators on policy issues regarding um, Medicaid managed care. There, there's a lot of opposition to it out there, still is, frankly. Um, so part of the job, again, was educating policymakers on the benefits of Medicaid managed care um, and why it made sense for the state to continue to have the programs, uh, the program in the state. Uh, and um, of all the years you've been in the healthcare space, I mean, how, how do you see that has progressed? I mean, in the state of Georgia, um, what changes have, been, have you been observing? Well, I, th I think the biggest change um, that I've observed in healthcare is um, there's so much more information about healthcare, so much more data on outcomes, um, on quality of care, and policymakers are beginning to understand um, that quality data. And since they control the purse strings, they appropriate the money, um, you know, I think they are making more informed decisions on, on what the healthcare needs of the state really are. Um, I think there, a lot of times in the past, because you don't have that data, policy follows, um, a, it's a reaction um, rather than being um, proactive. And so I think they're becoming more proactive. Uh, you know, just this past session, the governor here and uh, the speaker were instrumental in passing some mental health reform um, that is very much needed. For example, one of the things they did was lift the CON restrictions that I mentioned earlier um, on mental health care facilities so that there's greater access um, and, and because the need is certainly there. Um, but I think that's the biggest key is they're more informed, um, educated uh, policymakers. Um, now, they're still having to deal with, with one lobbyist coming in on one side and one coming in on another. Um, and, you know, sometimes they have to wear striped shirts because they have to referee these things. Um, so it's important as a lobbyist that you provide real information, 
um, factual inf information, um, less um, innuendo, less um, anecdotal, um, and, and more factual information. So they can base decisions off of real information. Okay. And then you moved on, which currently is your position, and you're the vice president at government and community affairs. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about what your organization does and what's your mission here? Okay. So um, I came to CTCA in, in 2016, um, and I, I was aware of CTCA. Um, I had never worked for them, but I was aware of who they were. They came into the state through legislation back in 2008 and opened their doors in 2012. And as I, as I referenced earlier, um, they, the previous legislation had restricted the number of Georgians that could be seen by this facility. And that was a, a policy piece that was put in to help protect the existing hospitals in the state. Who, Georgia had never seen a cancer-only facility. They really didn't know what to do with it. Um, so it had to come in through the legislature. Um, I, I was approached um, about taking on this challenge of trying to change the law. And, you know, I, I, I took it for a couple reasons. One, um, for professional reasons, I love the challenge. Um, and two, I believed in the cause. And, and, and three, I lost my mother to cancer in 2004, my sister-in-law in 2005. So cancer affected my life. And the, the man who founded CTCA or um, Cancer Treatment Centers, he started that because he lost his mother to cancer. And he was a wealthy banker and decided he was gonna change the way cancer care was being delivered. And I, I embraced that and that, that meant something to me from my heart. And so I truly believed in it. Um, what I found was is that um, the, the hospital community had done a good job of really disparaging CTCA and challenging our quality uh, and our, our um, ability to take patients. And so what I found was, is I was a little bit of David uh, putting rocks in a sling and, and trying to take down the Goliath that is the three different, or actually two hospital systems in the state. We, we actually had one hospital system that was working with us because they recognized the need for more access to cancer care. Um, I, I was fighting about 50 lobbyists on the hospital side. I, um, I, I kind of recalibrated the strategy that I referenced earlier. I brought on some additional lobbyists and, um, and really organized the process and began to change our messaging, um, if you will. I kind of used a, a, what I call the re-strategy. I, I had to um, rebuild some relationships. I had to repair a lot of relationships. And then once I could begin to do that, I, I started to um, kind of rebrand who CTCA was in the policy process. Um, we put together a pretty comprehensive public relations campaign and community um, growth campaign um, that was successful uh, in helping legislators understand that we had the wherewithal and the desire to promote this issue and that they had the, uh, the wherewithal to change this legislation. So we began really in 17 um, to introduce bits and pieces of change of legislation. Didn't think it was gonna pass, it didn't, but it began to um, you know, put shots over the bow and it forced the hospital community to, uh, to keep saying no and no, no. And to some extent they didn't, they, they were opposed to what we were doing, but they also did not want the code section that we were having to work with to be opened because that opened the door for a lot of other things that they didn't want. And so I, I finally figured out that how do we become the lesser of evils on this and get them to say no. So we began to talk to legislators about these big hospitals and are they meeting their community benefit standards in order to get the tax breaks they get? Because there's been a lot of question on that at the congressional level um, and, and in other places. And um, so what I was trying to do was force the hospitals into fight a two front war and forcing them to defend their tax exemptions was much more relevant to them than worried about this little 50 bed cancer hospital in, in Georgia. And uh, eventually in 2019, we were able to get them to the table and um, get them to change the law so that um, we have 
we don't have any restrictions. Um, any Georgian can come see us. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that since we've changed that law, there have probably been about 1,900 additional Georgians that, that have been able to access their cancer care at that facility. And, you know, my thought process was always, I don't care where you get your care, just get your care where you want to get your care, where you feel like you need to be. I mean, families had prayed about this, they thought about it, they'd done their research, they found the doctor and the, the staff and the business the model that they wanted, but yet this arbitrary law was telling them no, they couldn't do that. From a common sense perspective, you know, you'd, you'd go, well, why do we do that? And finally, we were able to win that battle and, um, and get that passed. And, you know, it is, I don't know if you're going to ask the question about what's the, the crowning achievement of my career, but it, there's no doubt that that's what it is. I, I've accomplished a lot, but enable, to be able to ensure that folks get access to care is important. That's an amazing story, Ray, and thanks for sharing that. Um, with that, we move on to the last segment, which is okay. where you can talk anything about either yourself, uh, your aspirations, or your organization, or if you're trying to run for office, anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me take that last one first. Um, no, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not running for office. I, um, you know, when I worked for Sam Nunn back in the in the '80s. Um, particularly in his hometown, I, I, I kind of get a, got a glimpse of that fishbowl environment. And um, I decided back then that I, I don't really want to do that. You know, unless when I retire, hopefully in a few years, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, we need you to do that, then I'd, I'd consider um, doing that. Um, you know, future aspirations. Um, I, I do have a side consulting firm um, lobbying consulting firm called Capital Legacy. Um, I do have one client there working with nurse anesthetists um, on a scope of practice and a quality of practice issue. Um, so, I, you know, whenever I'm done at CTCA, um, then, you know, I would look to do that. But I, I will put this plug in for CTCA. We just were acquired by um, a California-based um, entity called City of Hope, um, which is one of the I think U.S. News and World Report just ranked as number seven in the country in cancer care. And I'm excited about what they're going to be doing to bring additional research, clinical trials, partnering with CTCA. So I want to be a part of that for a while um, and, and see where that goes. Perfect. Well, Ray, um, it's really been a real honor to talk to you. Uh, with the way you've been conveying the communication skills you have, um, and the warmth you have in your personality. I'm pretty sure you'll have a very successful future. Thank you so Thank much you. for being on the show. I appreciate that. Thank you.